Hey everybody, it's Mr. McDermott, and today we're going to be going over monomers and polymers. And uh, monomers are going to be the building blocks for the macromolecules that we're going to learn about in this chapter. Okay. And so the macromolecules are going to be your carbohydrates, your lipids, your proteins, and your nucleic acids. And three of those are going to have monomers, our smaller subunits that uh, are built together to make the larger unit. So let's get started here. And so what are monomers? So uh, an easy way to think of a monomer would be a, think of it as a small molecule. That is uh, sometimes called a subunit. So if we use the word subunit, they're usually talking about a monomer. And sub here meaning smaller, so it's a smaller unit, okay? That when linked together will make a larger molecule and uh, we are going to call those larger molecules we're going to call them polymers because this word mo the prefix not word prefix here mono is going to mean one and poly is going to mean many so many of these smaller molecules linked together will make a polymer and to give you kind of an example here of, uh, of a, a few of these, maybe we can make a little table here real quick. And the in the table, what I'll do is I'll do uh, maybe two or three here. So so the monomer is going to be the small unit so we're going to look at the small unit first so an example of a small unit it, that would be maybe a amino acid Now there are actually 20 different amino acids we work with. So there's 20 different of these amino acids that could be a monomer. And then they would uh, be linked together to make the polymer, which is a polypeptide, because that's the bond that holds them together. And uh, sometimes some books will also call these proteins because the polymers can be uh, turned into a three-dimensional shape to make it a protein, or it could be linked to other polypeptides to make a protein. So they'll say amino acids make up proteins, or they could say amino acids make a polypeptide. Uh, and they kind of use these interchangeably, even though there are slight, there's a slight difference between the two. So. So amino acids is the monomer and then proteins are the polymer. Now going on to the next one, we could do uh, nucleotides. Nucleotides, which make up nucleic acids. And nucleic acids are gonna be like your DNA and RNA. So nucleotides make up nucleic acids. And so next we would have mono. Saccharides. Now sometimes these are called just simple sugars, but you know, technically they're monosaccharides. And uh, they're going to make up your polysaccharides. Moving forward, we're going to be looking at each one of these three. Uh, now, there's a fourth uh, lipids uh, 
the polymer, well, it's not polymer, the large molecule lipids, but lipids are not made up of smaller subunits that repeat. So that would not be a, an example of a polymer. They are macromolecules though. So here are the three. Amino acids making up proteins, nucleotides making up nucleic acids, and monosaccharides making up polysaccharides. And those right there would be your sugars. Okay, so let me clear this off and we'll keep on rocking and rolling. So I always like to use this uh, as an example or analogy, I should say. And so in this, we have a train. And if you look at this train, uh, each one of these little cars or whatever could themselves be an individual toy, right? You could play with just the engine or, or just the individual cars behind them. So they basically have this kind of repeating pattern of four wheels, a magnet, four wheels, you know, then a magnet to start here, four, four wheels, and then a magnet. So you see that repeating pattern there. So each one of those individually is a structure. Right? Each one of those individually is a structure. So you could think of them as a monomer. So each one of those is a monomer. They're individually, they could work by themselves. But man, they are a lot more entertaining if you were to put them all together, right? And so if you link them all together here, all of them together would be a polymer, right? Polymer. So they're made up, uh, it's a polymer is made up of smaller repeating units here. It makes a larger structure from those smaller repeating units. So that's what we have going on there. Now, I really like to talk about this when we're talking about proteins because it really fits the analogy really well for proteins. But if you look at a protein, it's made up of uh, amino acids. And amino acids are all the same. A big portion of that molecule is all the same. Just like this right here is a big portion of it is all the same. All amino acids have the same backbone, a nitrogen and a couple carbons. Okay. Every single amino acid has that same pattern. Nitrogen, and we call that its backbone, its carbon backbone. Now, how it differs from other uh, macromolecules is that in its carbon backbone, it actually has a nitrogen. So one third of its carbon backbone is nitrogen. So how it separates itself a little bit. But each uh, amino acid here, yeah, it's got the same carbon backbone, but off of the top, it has what we were gonna call an R group. An R group is just a uh, collection of atoms in a certain way. There are 20 different possible collections you can get to, for an R group. That's why we have 20 different amino acids. And that is what sets the uh, individual amino acids apart. So if you look at this lovely train here, all the bottoms are pretty much exactly the same. Two wheels, a magnet at the beginning, magnet at the end. They're all the same. The only thing that's really different about this train or the individual monomers of this train is what's on the back of that, of the two wheels, right? What's on the top of the two wheels? I shouldn't say back, but on the top of the two wheels. And so that changes what it does. It makes this one the train of the engine and this one the co-car, right? And makes this one a cargo car. So that is the significant portion of that structure. And when we look in the future here at amino acids, we're gonna see that that R group is what changes, okay? So let me clear this off and we'll go on. Uh, but I do so love this analogy because it, it does a good job of showing you how the smaller parts can be linked together to make the larger. Okay, so the next one is how do uh, monomers make polymers? And 
it should really say how are monomers put together to make polymers, okay? So because the monomers themselves aren't making it, there are enzymes there that are gonna be involved. They're gonna help put these together, okay? In a process called dehydration synthesis. So the example we're gonna use here is uh, a sugar. So here we have two sugars. Now this sugar here is glucose. Now the uh, formula for glucose is C6H12O6. So what does that mean? Like I always had teachers that would write this down and I always had a struggle a little bit with what that meant. What that means is that there are six carbons in this molecule and 12 hydrogens and six oxygens. Now you're probably looking at that and saying, well, I don't see any carbons or maybe just one. Well, that's because scientists kind of get lazy and they kind of understand what this molecule is. And so they leave off the carbons and the hydrogens and all, all that. And so they all know that that right there is where the, the lovely uh, carbons are. And so you could count these out. One, two, three, four, six carbons, right? So you could count that out and um, you could do that same for the hydrogens and for the oxygens. And you would be able to tell that that is a lovely uh, glucose molecule. So let me clear this off here. Now, this glucose molecule here is a monomer. Okay, it is a monomer. We sometimes call this a simple sugar, right? Because it's one ring, we're gonna call that a simple sugar. And here's another glucose molecule. Now we can put these together. The process of putting them together involves removing water. So what's gonna happen is that we're going to remove the water between these two. Now the oxygen is still saying there, and the oxygen is going to need two bonds. And so when you, when you separate, pull out the water, that second bond is going to be with the, the first uh, glucose. But this removing of water is the process of making that molecule. And that process is called dehydration synthesis. And so we took two glucose molecules and linked them together to make this new molecule. Now this has, uh, this lovely molecule has a new name. It's no longer two glucose. We're now gonna call it maltose. And the key thing here also, by the way, it's got an O-S-E at the end. Things that end in O-S-E are typically sugars. So glucose, maltose, sucrose uh, are typically sugars. Now, uh, this is a disaccharide. Disaccharide. Di meaning two. And so we took two monosaccharides, removed the water, to make maltose, which is a disaccharide. Now, um, this process would need an enzyme. There'd be an enzyme there. An enzyme is gonna be a biological catalyst, which we'll learn later in the chapter, but a biological catalyst is there to kind of speed up the reaction. The catalyst is not used up, but if it doesn't have this catalyst, this reaction would take way too much time. It would probably wouldn't even occur. So we, your body is filled with enzymes to help you out with this. So how do, how are monomers put together to make polymers? They remove the water through a process called dehydration synthesis and link together the smaller units to make the larger unit, okay? Clear that off here. Now, here we have lovely 
uh, proteins. Now, proteins are proteins are the polymer. Amino acids are the monomer. Okay, and so an amino acid has a carbon backbone that looks like this. Okay, so we had two amino acids here. It would look like this. Now off of this carbon backbone, they're gonna have some, uh, what we call functional groups. Functional groups are just lovely uh, atoms that we always tend to like see together. So we're gonna have that. And we'll have this, right? So that right there would be one amino acid. Okay. Now, when you look at that amino acid, this right here is considered a functional group right here. This is called an amine. They sometimes write it as NH2. That's called an amine functional group. And this right here is called uh, a, it's sometimes written as a COOH, carboxyl, okay? And it's carboxyl functional group. And so each amino acid always has those two. Oops, why did I write it that way? I have no clue. Let me get up here, erase that oxygen off there. There. Get myself. Now I put the R groups up here at the top. You could rot those, rotate those down to the bottom here. And, and switch them and all the R groups would, here's the thing about it, all the R groups are always on the same side, okay? I put it on top to say consistent with my first drawing whenever we did the uh, lovely trains, right? Uh, it was the tops of the trains that, that changed. And so that's why I kept this drawing the same. But amino acids are gonna be linked together to make polypeptides. It's gonna be the same process that we saw before. Uh, it's gonna be uh, dehydration synthesis. So we're gonna move this water right here out. And once they remove that water out, you're going to get two together, right? They're going to be put together. And uh, the water is going to be removed here. Let me move that out. Whenever water is removed, you're going to form a bond. And the bond you're going to form is going to be called a peptide bond. So that peptide bond there is uh, why when you get a long line of these, it's called a polypeptide. It's still just a covalent bond. Right? Each one of these lines represents a covalent bond. Sometimes kids forget that, so I want to remind you. Covalent bond, which means to share, right? Co means to share. If you're a co-MVP, you share the reward. So covalent, you're sharing the valence electrons, right? And if it's a double line, that is a double covalent bond. Sometimes kids always wanna know why that equal sign's there. And that just means it's a double covalent bond. Just a little bit of a review there, okay? So once you pull that out, uh, you now have two amino acids together, okay? And so a, uh, a protein would be many of these linked together. So you can think of it kind of like this. Each little box maybe represents an amino acid. And between each amino acid would be a peptide bond because you removed water between each amino acids. And so, so here, And 
and now that right there would be a lovely poly peptide. Right? Now, this area here, this R group, that's the only difference between these uh, two molecules. And what that R group means, so I want to maybe box that up. Maybe we can look at that closer here. That R group right there. I could change that in each one. I could come in here and erase this R here. And I could actually put in an actual atoms here. And I'll do, I guess I'll do that real quick here. So maybe I'm just going to come up here and put another carbon. And so that would be one R group. And this one, I could go in and change this R group to, a, to uh, a different set of atoms. Let me highlight it again, though, just so you guys know where we're focusing on. So I'm going to erase the R group. I'm going to put the actual atoms there. They do that as shorthand, right? They, they, when they're doing a generic version of the uh, lovely R group, then uh, instead of writing all of these different possibilities out, they... Uh, do a little shorthand. These are all hydrogens here. I know it's kind of small and kind of blends together there. Now this has a hydroxide. So that is a little different than this one. So those are two different amino acids. Okay, so each amino acid will be all exactly the same except for their R group right here. And so the R groups are what makes them different. And the R groups are always on the same side. They're always going to be on the same side. So it's sided and has a sidedness. All right. So uh, getting off here, amino acids make up polypeptides, which are, can be turned into proteins. So amino acids make up proteins. They do it through dehydration synthesis. They have an amine group and a carboxyl group. Okay. Okay, now I'm not going to spend much time on the uh, sugars because um, they are uh, the drawing of the sugars. It was actually in the example with glucose. So most of these you know, are going to be involving glucose or fructose. But what I'll do is I'm going to list some uh, monosaccharides here that we see. And so uh, example of monosaccharides. It's kind of hard in the eyes, it's sort of blue. So monosaccharides here. Mono meaning one sugar. So examples of monosaccharides would be the things like glucose, which we've already talked about. Fructose, which is sweeter. The lactose, which is going to be found in uh, milk. Ribose, which is going to be found in RNA, and deoxyribose. Which is going to be found in DNA. So they are going to be, you know, the monosaccharides that you see quite a bit. Okay, these five. But uh, the first two or three are going to be the ones you see that get made into other things. So a disaccharide, meaning two of these together. Are, are two sugars, and I guess it doesn't have to be these. But so, for instance, glucose plus glucose is going to make the guy, disaccharide uh, maltose, and then uh, glucose plus fructose makes sucrose, which you think of as table sugar. Okay. Now you could link a lot of glucose together and get a polysaccharide. Polysaccharide. Examples of polysaccharide that use glucose linked together are gonna to be starch and cellulose. And then another polysaccharide we see quite often is chitin. Okay. 
Uh, and then the one that we store, by the way, starch is stored in plants. That's what plants use. The plants also use cellulose uh, to make their cell walls. It's uh, bonded slightly different, beta bonding versus alpha bonding, which impression you don't have to, impression biology you don't have to quite get into. Uh, and then the last one is going to be glycogen. Now, I want to point out that words that end in OSC, they're typically sugars, right? And words that begin with G-L-Y-C-O, glyco, are typically sugars. So those are your, uh, your monosaccharides, your disaccharides, your polysaccharides. And I want to also put that this right here column, these are sometimes referred to as simple sugars. So simple sugars make up starch. Simple sugars make up cellulose, right? So they're not always going to use the word monosaccharide. They can interchangeably use simple sugars. Clear this off here and let's go on. Okay, nucleic acids and nucleotides. So the nucleic acids uh, are going to be, it's going to be the lovely uh, polymer. It's going to be the polymer. And these are the monomer. Okay. Now, uh, examples are going to be DNA and RNA. Okay. And so uh, these nucleotides are going to have three parts. The first part of each nucleotide. Uh, Typically, they're going to tell you that it's going to be the phosphates. It's going to have a phosphate functional group. And a phosphate functional group is basically going to be a phosphate with some oxygens coming off of it. It's going to make it negative, uh, which makes the whole molecule negative, which is used later on. It's going to have a sugar. Now, if it is DNA, it's going to, the sugar is going to be deoxyribose. And if it's RNA, it's going to be ribose. So as the name suggests, one less uh, oxygen there between the two. And then third, probably the uh, most important part is going to be the nitrogenous base. So we're gonna have bases. And the bases are gonna consist of uh, five possibilities. In, uh, in DNA, you could have adenine, thymine, guanine, Or cytosine and uh, in RNA instead of thymine you're going to have uracil uracil you say it right there so those are the uh, five possible bases you could have with RNA and DNA and so let me uh, and so nucleotides are made up, and this, you know, is a very good test question in a lot of schools. Uh, what three things make up a nucleotide? And so a phosphate group, a sugar, a nitrogen base. Okay. Now, looking at the, uh, the two groups, DNA and RNA, uh, DNA is going to be two strands. of nucleotides. So it's got two strands, one here and one here, that's gonna be held together in the middle by hydrogen bonds. So it's two polynucleotide strands, poly meaning many. So many nucleotides linked together are gonna to be polynucleotides. And so if you have two strands of that linked together, then that's gonna be your DNA structure. And then RNA is going to only have one strand. Now I'm gonna draw it pretty linear here. 
but no, it could be folded up into, you know, other shapes and stuff and, and is folded up in other shapes because it can actually bond to itself. We like to think of more of messenger RNA when we think of RNA. It's the one that's in the uh, news quite a bit here lately, and it's going to be single strand. Okay. These are going to be found for the genetic material. DNA has the genetic material. Its information is used to make RNA. Uh, RNA doesn't alter uh, DNA. RNA will leave the nucleus uh, and then go to a ribosome where it's going to assemble a protein. It's, it's not the other way around, which tends to be something that is uh, being said quite often now. Uh, but uh, that is not the case. So uh, someone tells you that your RNA is going to change your DNA. That is uh, simply not true. So there we go, nucleotides. Here we are with the last group. Now this last group, I saved them for last because they're actually not, they're not a uh, monomer or a polymer, but they are a macromolecule. So we want to discuss them here. And so we're going to look at one grouping of lipids. There are other groupings of lipids like steroids or waxes, but we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at fats and oils here. And so in a particular type, and so the particular type we're looking at is going to involve a molecule called glycerol. Now, it's always said to have a glycerol backbone. That just means that it's carbons that right here are going to be the starting point uh, for this molecule. So uh, when you look at this molecule here, this is the glycerol portion. And then off of this molecule, you're going to have fatty acids. And in the case of triglyceride, you'll have three fatty acids coming off of it. Now we're only going to draw one fatty acid here uh, for simplicity. Actually, I may do two just to show uh, another concept called saturated and unsaturated. But these fatty acids here, would have a carbon here. It's, there we go with green, so you can distinguish between the two. So we have uh, a carbon backbone. And if it's unsaturated, that carbon backbone would have no double bonds. And so it's going to have a carbonyl group coming off of it and then a hydroxyl group. And it's this hydroxyl group here and this hydroxyl group here that are going to be bonded, pull the water away for dehydration synthesis, which makes what's called a, a, an ester bond. You don't necessarily have to know that for freshman bio, but uh, that's the name of the type of bond there. And so this structure right here, This structure right here is called a uh, fatty acid, okay? And so uh, some of you are right, Mr. McDermott, that does not seem right. There seems like it's a whole lot of empty stuff there. Carbon's supposed to have four bonds on my astute. So yeah, there would be, uh, coming off of this, there would be uh, hydrogens at every position here. I'm not going to take the time to do that, but you just have to assume that there would be hydrogens at every position here. So this last one here would have a hydrogen, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen. And since there's hydrogen at every bonding position, we're going to say that this right here fatty acid is saturated. If we were to draw another fatty acid, Okay, just uh, to teach the concept of unsaturated. And if you notice, I'm always writing these down an even number of carbons. Uh, that's because 
in nature, they tend to have even numbers. See one without even numbers is probably man-made, man-made fact. So if, oops, let me go ahead and draw a double bond here. So if you notice, we have a double bond right here at this position. Because of that double bond, we would say that this molecule is not saturated, it is unsaturated. unsaturated. And so you would still have hydrogens off at each point, but when you got to this section right here, instead of having two hydrogens at each bonding point, you would only have you would only have uh, one on each carbon. So there's none right here, right, Cynthia? Which causes this molecule to bend. So this one's very linear and straight. Saturated tend to be straight, uh, and the unsaturated here are going to bend, and this is going to have a big effect on it. The, the saturated are going to be solid, your animal fats, and your unsaturated are going to be liquid at room temperature. Okay, so uh, another big thing about this because of these hydrocarbons that are linked out, which hydrocarbons just mean carbons and hydrogens together. Uh, your lipids are going to be nonpolar. Uh, which means they don't mix with water. Well, that brings us to the end of the macromolecules. I hope uh, maybe that helps you out when you're studying. If you have any questions, uh, please just let me know. And you should you just have a good day.